So, yes, so thank you very much for the uh, invitation and specific uh, um, big thanks to the organizers of this workshop and congratulations for doing such an excellent job of bringing us together and talking about color kinematics duality. Can you see my screen? Is that working actually? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so let me zoom in on this beautiful swan that uh, Leron had there and talk a little bit more about that story about homotopy algebras in QFT and uh, in particular in relation to color kinematics duality. Um, I'll be very down to earth. So this is all from, a, if you just want to understand roughly what's going on, it's just glorified linear algebra. And um, I'll, I'll be very down to earth. So for mathematicians of warning, I won't be 100% rigorous for pedagogical reasons, but I think you can still get something out of it. Um, and yeah, so, so I just realized that Leron was much more pessimistic about the month in which our paper will come out. I still, I hope it's, it's May, but it may be June or a little bit later. Okay, so let me start with, um, if this works, uh, let me start with this observation. Um, very, very crude sketch of what we do when we compute tree level scattering amplitudes in perturbative QFT. Namely, we have our free incoming particles, they come into an interaction region and free outgoing particles. And literally what we do at the LHC where we have beams collide in interaction region, right? Um, and then you uh, study a little bit of mathematics because you're interested in, in fancy new things, right? And then you come across this construction or computation of so-called minimal models of L infinity algebras and you find that this is practically identical to what people in mathematics do there. So, so you have also kind of kind of legs that denote elements in, in this ominous minimal model. And then they are mapped to some L infinity algebra where everything is kind of connected with all kinds of trees. And then you have uh, as an outcome, again, elements in a minimal model. And then if you study this a little bit further, then you find that there's a very natural link between both descriptions. And this link is given by the battalion Wilkowski formula. Um, and this provides now the exciting uh, perspective that uh, if you have any structures on top of scattering amplitudes, any mysterious phenomena that you observe within scattering amplitude, that you know that this should be essentially a homotopy algebraic refinement of the original L infinity algebra, right? So whatever you find, if this has a systematic thing in there, it should fit within this homotopy algebraic framework. And therefore there are strong mathematical constraints on this. And this helps you to identify what's going on and identify structures. And I'll show you in particular the example of CK duality. And we saw already quite a bit in, in Leron's previous talk. Okay, quick outline. I'll summarize uh, what, what L infinity algebras actually are. Um, every L infinity algebra comes with its own field theory, if it's cyclic, or also when it's not cyclic actually, which is called homotopy mauer katar theory, and I'll review that. And then I should convince you, hopefully, that every field theory that you know is actually a homotopy mauer katar theory. I'll review a little bit homotopy algebras and related technology, but mostly with a few of examples and applications in QFT, so I'll show you that there's really a lot of technology that you can take from mathematics and carry over onto the QFT side. Then the main thing that people may be interested in here in this workshop is of course color kinematics duality and then the BB box and BB box infinity algebras or homotopy BB box algebras. And I'll, if I have enough time, I'll uh, have a quick comment also on the double copy and a few uh, comments on the loop level. Already heard a question before on this. Okay, so from Lie algebras to L infinity algebras, Lie algebras are usually used to describe symmetries. L infinity algebras also describe symmetries and higher symmetries, but they're even a little bit richer. Um, so how do you get to them? So Lie algebra is a fairly harmless object. Everybody knows that, right? We have a vector space G, and then we have a Lie bracket that's anti-symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi identity. And for convenience, particularly as physicists, we often introduce a basis so that we have structure constants and so on. So, and this is quite helpful here for making the link to L infinity algebra. So let me also introduce basis. Um, so there's a dual description, which is known in the mathematical literature as the chevalier ironberg algebra. And this works as follows. You start from the dual vector space. So the linear function is on your original vector space and you shift it in degree by minus one. And this is uh, the mathematician's notion. I mean, because we dualize effectively, it's a shift by plus one. So <laughs> the, the notation, the shifts and degrees and signs in the story are a little bit problematic, but once you get used to that, um, you can deal with this, right? So uh, there's a dual vector space, G1 star. And on this vector space, we introduce a basis. And because uh, the elements in this are of degree uh, one, so, so it's a basis. And the basis are essentially coordinate functions on the original space shifted by one. And now what we want to do is we want to write down the most general vector field 
of degree one on the original shifted space, right? So we have this coordinate function. So what's a vector field? Well, it should be derivative with respect to a coordinate function that takes away one in degree. So to have a total degree of one, of plus one, we should add two more coordinate functions of degree one. So this structure is kind of fixed for you. And then we're doing linear algebra. So we linearly combine everything in the most general way. We slap in a coefficient for convenience. And then we get this vector field here. And now the interesting thing is that the condition that Q squared equals zero, so that this vector field is actually a differential on the algebra of function, this is equivalent to the Jacobi identity in the Lie algebra. Right? So there's a very nice uh, way in which you can um, encode the Lie algebra dually, and it's important for Lie algebra, com Lie algebra cohomology and all kinds of other contexts. Now, if you look at this construction, namely the Chevalier-Ahnberg algebra of Lie algebra here, up here I put it up again, um, then you could wonder, I mean, how can I generalize that? Well, something that comes to mind immediately is why do I just use a vector space? Why do I not use a graded vector space, for example, that may be a little bit more interesting. And indeed you can do this, and if you do this, you arrive at the chevalier einberg algebra of an L-infinity algebra, right? So we have now not just a, a, a vector space, but we have a graded vector space, and it's indeed Z-graded. I mean, some some literature you find that L-infinity algebra only negatively graded or positively graded. Here we would like to have Z-graded. And again, we have a basis, but all these basis elements are not of degree one, but they can have essentially any degree, any Z degree that you like. And then you write down the most general homological vector field because uh, these elements can have now any degree. Now you have a, a lot of, a lot more options that you had before of what the um, homological vector field can look like. And you have essentially expressions that range from, um, from, from linear terms all the way to, to, to arbitrary order index i, right? And correspondingly, you get these structure constants here, right? I mean, the structure constants of the Lie algebra have essentially two lower indices and one upper index corresponding to two inputs and one output. We preserve the property that we would just want to have one output, but we have now arbitrarily many inputs, right? So, so in particular, you have one, two, three, and so on inputs. If you want, there's also generalization for zero inputs, but we'll always have at least one input here. Okay, so duly to this homological vector field, just as we had up here, the structure constants defining a Lie bracket, we have now this more general structure constants that we obtained just by replacing a vector space by a graded vector space, we get now new brackets, which have now several inputs, right? So you now define these new brackets from the structure constants. Okay, so, and then Q squared equals zero is equivalent to the so-called homotopy Jacobi identity on these new or higher brackets or there are various names for them. Okay, so let's uh, switch to the L infinity algebra in the bracket picture. So we have a graded vector space, right? Before we had uh, this dual graded vector space L shifted by one on dualized, right? And now we want to work directly on L just as we did in the case of the Lie algebra. So we have this graded vector space over here. Then we have the graded totally anti-symmetric multilinear brackets, which are given here, right? And um, because of all the degree counting, they have a specific degree, which is not that important to us. Um, and these will satisfy the higher or homotopy Jacobi identity, uh, which is given uh, in, in this formula. Uh, actually, there are several identities for every natural number you actually get an identity. And we can look a little bit at this identity and see what it actually means. So you see it's a quadratic relation just as for the Lie bracket for the Jacobi relation, which also has always two nested uh, Lie brackets. And we have the same here, we have two nested higher brackets. Um, so first of all, for n equals one, if you specialize to this case, you see that the uh, homotopy Jacobi identity just reads as mu1, mu1 equals zero. So mu1 is a differential. And therefore, our graded vector space is turned into a complex, which is very nice because for complex, we have all kinds of technology. We have quasi isomorphisms, we have uh, cohomology, and so on. And we'll use all of that. For n equals two, if you work out what these relations are, you see that it implies that um, mu1 is actually derivation with respect to mu2. So it just distributes as a Leibniz rule as you would expect. And for n equals, um, uh, where are we, two? Uh, for n equals three, actually what we get is we get the Jacobi identity on the left-hand side, but the Jacobi identity is not uh, valid on the nose, but it's valid up to um, a violating term. And this violating term is exactly a cosine, right? So, so this is essentially it's violated by homotopy and this is where the name of all this comes from. The important thing is violated in a very controlled way. 
And this product mu three together with the differential gives you control about how it's violated. Okay, so let's look at a few special cases to show you that there are, the world is full of L infinity algebras essentially. So of course, Lie algebras are L infinity algebras are special cases where our graded vector space is, we say, concentrated in degree zero. They're graded Lie algebras, which appear in supersymmetry and all kinds of other concepts. Uh, and uh, for them, essentially, these higher products vanish unless I is equal to two, right? There's a graded Lie algebra. Um, most interestingly are differential graded Lie algebras, and this is where the higher products are zero if i is larger than two. So we have only unary and binary operations in these. But then there are more examples. So um, if you uh, um, follow a little bit the story of, of um, higher forms and the gauge symmetry, then you quickly get into categorified Lie algebras. And these are the ones that are concentrated in negative uh, in non-positive degrees, I should say. So the, this graded vector space is trivial if the degree is positive. Um, you can package up a Lie algebra together with a representation if you want in such an L infinity algebra. And you can also work directly just with complexes. For example, the Dirham complex is also an L infinity algebra. Right? So, so all of these are various forms of L infinity algebras. But the most important thing to keep in mind for our uh, purposes is that L infinity algebras are generalizations of DG Lie algebras, of differential graded Lie algebras, where we also allow for brackets of high arity and Jacobi identity and uh, is violated in a controlled fashion. Right, so if you want to write down uh, actions, you know that we need a notion of an inner product on our Lie algebra. This is the killing form. This is a very famous example. So um, inner product is clear how it's defined, right? It's positive, definite, depending on your preference, or at least non-degenerate, right? You want it to be symmetric, bilinear, and you want it to be compatible with the Lie algebra uh, in, in the sense that it satisfies the cyclic relation over here. Um, again, our guiding principle to finding out how we generalize things to L infinity algebras is the Chevalier Einberg pictures. So we could look at what does it mean to have an inner product on our Lie algebra from the Chevalier Einberg perspective. And there you get something very interesting, namely that the inner product is duly a symplectic form on this shifted vector space. It has a particular degree and has to be compatible with the brackets in the sense that the homological vector field Q that defined our brackets duly um, has to be a symplectic morphism, right? So, so, so the Lie derivative uh, long Q of omega has to vanish. <coughs> But if this is true, then it's immediately clear how to generalize that to L infinity algebras because we just replace our vector space by graded vector space, right? And then you get a cyclic structure on L infinity algebra. It's non-degenerate in particular sense, well, in, in straightforward sense. It's graded symmetric by linear, and then you have the cyclicity relation that is this here, right? So this is an appropriate notion of an inner product. Okay, and this is essentially everything uh, I want to say concretely about L infinity algebras. That's it, that's all you need. So see, it's just a little bit of glorified linear algebra. Now let's put this glorified linear algebra to some use, namely applied to field theory. And uh, the thing is that we use a, a field theory called homotopy mauer cartan theory, and every L infinity algebra comes with this field theory. And this field theory is universal in the sense that every field theory that you know is a homotopy mauer cartan theory, right? In a sense, it's one ring to rule them all. All right, so L infinity algebras are generalizations of differential graded Lie algebras. And therefore, let's look back at those, because for those, we know what the mauer cartan equations are, right? So we just write them down. So differential and the commutator, just a field strength that you would write down for some abstract gauge potential A, and you put this equal to zero, right? So this is not very difficult. We know that L infinity is algebras are generalizations of DG Lie algebras. So what's the appropriate generalization? There are, of course, lots of mathematical ways of deriving this, but just uh, heuristically, I mean, I guess everybody will guess naturally what the generalization is. Namely, instead of just having the unary and binary operation, you also introduce all the higher arity operations, right? So, so you have mu1, mu2, and mu3, and so on, all the way to infinity. And if you want an equation of this expression at zero, um, we call the A a generalized, if you want, some gauge potential. The F is like the generalized curvature of this expression. And you can indeed do gauge theory. So you have gauge transformations of this. You have Bianchi identities as well. And everything is very nice. And this is a straightforward generalization of a form of transcendence theory or something like that. You have. Um, if you have a cyclic structure, um, then you can also um, obtain the homotopy mauer cartan equation from an action principle. And this action principle is simply of this particular form, right? So, so it's, a, it's a homotopy generalization, a far, far, far reaching generalization of transcendence theory. 
uh, this theory really encompasses all the field theories, you know. Yeah, as I said, all perturbative field theories certainly are homotopy in Mauer-Cartan theories. And let me make this precise. So first, uh, the, the bridge, as I said, in the very beginning between uh, field theories and homotopy algebras is a belief formalism. So let me quickly um, recall the three ingredients. So we want to resolve the quotient space of observables. Remember the observables, we want to get rid of gauge symmetry and we want to impose the equations of motion and we have to do both. So for the first step for gauge symmetry, we introduce ghosts, as you know, from the BRST formalism that resolves the gauge redundancy. And in the second step, that's a step from BRST to BB, if you want. So we introduce anti-fields to resolve also the, uh, the condition of imposing the equations of motion. And um, so therefore the BV formalism perfectly applies to field theories without um, gauge symmetry, because after all, I mean, we always have equations of motions to resolve. So BV also applies here. And uh, in order to implement both the gauge symmetry and equation of motion and to encode them, this will be done by differential QBV, the BV differential, right? I mean, the resolution is essentially a way of encoding these things in, in uh, cohomology. And for cohomology, we need differential and this differential is the BV differential. Um, a second ingredient that we have is the so-called anti-bracket that pairs fields with anti-fields. And this anti-bracket is given by a symplectic form, right? So a symplectic form probably rings a bell from inner products that we saw earlier, defines a pairing. And the BV field space is a symplectic graded vector space, okay? So we have a symplectic graded vector space and we have a differential. So this defines a differential graded commutative algebra. And this is precisely the dual data of an L-infinity algebra L. This is nothing but the Chevalier-Allenberg algebra description of an L-infinity algebra, right? So the BV formalism gives you on the nose um, an L-infinity algebra, cyclic L-infinity algebra. You can actually leave this uh, pairing if you have a field theory that's just given by equations of motion, and then you get an L-infinity algebra with allowed cyclicity as well. Okay, so we can show that both the original action that you started from, as well as the BV action in which you put in all the ghosts, the antifields, Nakanishi, Laotropes, um, uh, and so on, so, so the BD action, they are both homotopy mauer cartan theories. They, they all fit within this uh, framework. And uh, the way uh, that, that you interpret now these different ingredients is as follows. So we have our L-infinity algebra up here, and I gave you here a little snippet of it. So encoding L0, L1, L2, L3. L1 is where the physical fields live, and L0 is where the gauge transformations, the ghosts live. L2 is where the anti-fields live, and it's also where, where the uh, left-hand side of the equations of motion lives. L3 is where the anti-fields to the ghost lives, and this is also where the neuter identities uh, live and so on. So there's a very physical interpretation of this whole L-infinity algebra and the graded vector spaces uh, that are contained within. So interestingly is that all is a problem of coincidence that this works because the action for closed string field theory um, is also homotopy mauer cartan action for an L-infinity algebra. And so you can now debate whether um, the BV formalism is a shadow of string field theory or string theory, um, or whether this is more a general feature of all uh, gauge, uh, of all theories that have a gauge symmetry, right? I mean, uh, to be fair, I, I think it's rather the latter. I wouldn't argue that here the shadow of string theory. Um, a quick example, I don't want to go through this in detail, but let me convince you that um, it's very, very easy to read off the L-infinity algebra from your BV action, right? You just set up your usual BV formulas and write down the BV action, which is really not that hard. And then you can read off all the differentials, the field spaces and the higher products, right? Um, the, uh, the field space is just what your L1 is. You have ghosts and then you dualize, right? The dual objects will give you L2 and L3. The higher products, the differentials are really easily read off just from the quadratic expression from the kinematical part of your action and all the higher products then correspond to the various interactions that you have, right? For example, mu three of AAA just gives the quartic vertex of a gluon, right? Because remember this mu three will be paired with an additional A in the homotopy mauer cartan action. So you have a quartic expression encoded in mu three. And then you can show that the homotopy mauer cartan action where you just put the, the gauge potential, the generalized gauge potential where you identify this with the gluon field is the Young-Mills action. And that there's a trick where you essentially put in a super field, which consists of gay, uh, ghosts of um, the gluon field of the anti-field to the gluons and the anti ghost then you get the BV action and you can incorporate Nakanishi larger field and anti ghost as well. That's not a problem, right? So every field theory that you have really fits within this framework. And oh, that's very nice because we can now put this to some use. 
Right, so let me talk a little bit more about homotopy algebras and the applications to physics. Um, and the idea is here that this framework, which is sometimes um, also called abstract nonsense, which is this field consisting of high category theory, homotopy algebras, operas, and all these modern mathematical tools, um, it really puts everything into perspective and orders everything. It tells you where everything should be, what should work, what shouldn't work, and so on. So this is a very convenient framework if you want to uh, make conjectures about how things should actually be before you verify them. So L infinity algebras are homotopy Lie algebras, and as Liron already suggested, um, a good way of looking at homotopy Lie algebras are these operats. Um, I don't want to go into details what they actually are, but think of them as things that have n incoming and one outgoing legs. That's generalizations that also <laughs> relax this condition, but let's work with these. And we have a rule for composition, right? So, so there's rules of how you can uh, combine them into trees and how these uh, various uh, trees should be related. So each algebra that you know of, like associative, commutative, or Lie algebras, are algebras over an operat. And for each operat, we have something, or for most operats, we have something called causal duality, which um, is a duality operation, so an evolution. If you apply it twice, you go back to where you started from. Uh, and the causal dual of the associative operat is associative operat. The causal dual of the Lie operat is the commutative operat. And now if you would like to construct a homotopy algebra, there's a simple prescription. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit more detail on the mathematical side, but essentially you do the following. You take your algebra, you take the causal dual, you take the differential graded version of that, and then you take once more the dual, and then you have the homotopy algebra. Let me show you the example. L infinity algebras we saw, they're so-called homotopy Lie algebras. So they are dual to differential graded commutative algebras, right? The Lie operat. We take the causal dual. The causal dual of the Lie operat is a commutative algebra opera. We take the corresponding differential graded algebra, right? So differential graded commutative algebras, and they are the dual thing to the L infinity algebra because differential graded commutative algebras are nothing but the Chevalier Eilenberg algebra that we encountered before of our L infinity algebra, with the differential being the um, Chevalier Eilenberg differential, in the case of field theories being the BD differential. Correspondingly, you can easily define A infinity algebras, homotopy associative algebras, they're dual to DG as uh, algebras. And then we have also commutative C infinity algebras, homotopy commutative algebras, which are dual to differential graded Lie algebras. Right? So, so in this way, you define all kinds of homotopy algebras. And there are many other operas that you can introduce for Leibniz algebras. Uh, Leon quickly flashed the EL infinity algebras that we defined last year. So, so um, you, you can construct all kinds of algebras and then correspondingly the homotopy algebras of them. So what is all that good, right? I mean, there's a lot of abstract nonsense that is uh, justifiably called. Uh, so, so what is that good for you? Uh, why, why should you be interested in it? Well, first of all, we have strong and useful mathematical results. So we have a lot of structure, for example, as tensor products, which will become important. We have notions of morphisms and equivalences. We know when to homotopy algebra should be considered mathematically equivalent. And usually this is also the appropriate notion at the physical level. Then we have uh, powerful theorems about homotopy algebras, which are relevant in, in what comes. There's first of all the strictification theorem, namely any homotopy O algebra, whichever O that is, we can strictify to a differential graded O algebra, right? So these homotopy algebras usually have higher arity operations, but in a, in a mathematically well-defined sense, we can switch to an equivalent version, which has only unary and binary operations, right? This is very, very useful and essentially is, is used in the color kinematics duality to make our field theory cubic, right? So, so this is underlying the strictification theorems underlying this. Then there's the so-called minimal model theorem, and that tells us that any homotopy O algebra is equivalent to a homotopy O algebra on its cohomology. Remember that homotopy O algebras have a complex differential complex underlying it. We can compute its cohomology, and then any homotopy O algebra is equivalent to that in a particular sense. Again, as you probably remember from the first slide, this is relevant to uh, compute tree-level scattering amplitude. So it's nothing but the minimal model theorem. And finally, there's the homotopy perturbation lemma or homotopy transfer, if you want, which is a recursive construction um, that, that tells you how you get an equivalent homotopy algebra starting from equivalent differential complexes. Right? So, so this is a very powerful tool, so, uh, which, which allows you in particular to construct the minimal model theorem. Okay, so, so there's a lot of abstract nonsense, but now let's put it to some use. All of this has interesting consequences, applications to field theory. 
First of all, we have a very, very simple operation, namely color stripping in Young Mills theory, right? I mean, you all know that in the amplitudes business, we, we often like to color strip because that allows us to separate the kinematics from color in the Young Mills amplitudes. And uh, this has uh, the following equivalent uh, formulation in terms of homotopy algebras. We factorize the Lie algebra of the field theory that we're interested in, for example, Young Mills theory, into a color Lie algebra and a C infinity algebra that describes the kinematics of Young Mills theory, right? So this is nothing but a homotopy algebraic generalization of being able to take the tensor product of a Lie and a commutative algebra. So if you think a little bit about how you can do that, a uh, commutative algebra and Lie algebra always gives you a Lie algebra, right? And this is just a homotopy algebraic generalization, okay? That's not particularly difficult, of course, but it's nice that you can't just do that at the level of amplitudes, but you can do that at the level of L infinity algebras and in particular at the level of actions, and you can do that consistently. So another thing is strictification, and I already mentioned that, uh, what it means for us, namely, uh, sometimes it's simpler to argue about field theories that have only cubic vertices, and from a homotopy algebra perspective, that's strictification, which is guaranteed by the strictification theorem. We have a construction algorithm available, that's also not too difficult, and this is, of course, what you use in color kinematics duality, when we want to parenterize the scattering amplitudes in terms of cubic vertices. So effectively, there's an underlying field theory that has only a cubic interactions, right? And this is guaranteed to exist by the strictification theorem. Another uh, perspective is, of course, a string theory uh, you can rewrite in terms of cubic interactions, right? And um, again, this is not surprising that any field theory should be derived from something with purely cubic interactions if you think a little bit about the strictification theorem. All right, so now let's come to homotopy transfer, which allows us to take one L infinity algebra structure and construct an equivalent L infinity algebra structure from it. Recall that any L infinity algebra, as any homotopy algebra actually, has an underlying differential complex. And um, if to perform homotopy transfer, what we do is we start from two quasi isomorphic complexes. That means just that there is a chain map between the two differential complexes that induces an uh, iso um, isomorphism on the corresponding cohomology with respect to differentials, right? So, so there's a well-defined structure that you start from. For physicists, what you can think of is that these are just free theories. You have th th theories where you don't have any interactions, right? And it's very easy to see whether two such theories are equivalent or not. And then you consider all the higher products that encode the interactions as perturbations. And this allows you then a recursive prescription of how, um, how you have higher brackets induced also on L prime. So you really transfer the higher brackets, everything above the differential from L to L prime by recursive prescription. So applications of this is first of all that you can very, very uh, quickly construct field theories that are quasi isomorphic or in physical parlance that are semi-classically equivalent. That means that they have the same tree level uh, S matrix. Um, for um, this other complex that you start from the minimal model, so if the differentials are all trivial, you recover the minimal model itself. And in particular, if you work out of how these higher brackets are constructed, it is nothing but the tree level Feynman diagram expansion that we know from quantum field theory, right? I mean, this is literally the same thing. There's no difference whatsoever in the computations that you perform. The only difference, of course, that you work with infinite dimensional, that's not a difference, complication that you work with infinite dimensional vector spaces. And uh, I should stress that this is tree level, right? However, if you introduce another perturbation, which is motivated by the DV formalism, so this delta is essentially the DV Laplacian, it's a dual of it that creates a field and anti-field, uh, allow, allowing you to form loops in your trees, and you also get the loop level Feynman diagram expansion. You have to go a little bit beyond L infinity algebra, say you work with a loop or a loop L infinity algebra. So all of this is really, really nice and powerful. For example, you can use the recursive prescription that we obtain in this homotopy transfer to prove that there are baron skeeler recursion relation. You, you may know them. I mean, they, they were very popular in Young-Mills theory. They underlie or they, they contribute to the proof of the MHV relations. And these really exist for any field theory and also at loop level, right? In the original paper, this was just Young-Mills theory at tree level. But this recursive prescription is essentially the generalization to all field theories at loop level. All right, so let's conclude a little bit uh, what we saw so far. Um, first of all, we had a Feynman diagram expansion, and we show that this is equivalent to computing 
a minimal model. So what is that good for? Well, first of all, it's now very, very easy in principle to explain to a mathematician what we are actually doing in quantum field theory, because you can just, just say, well, a field theory is essentially an L-infinity algebra, compute its minimal model, right? And if you're math the mathematician you're talking to is an algebraist, they may actually know what, what's going on. Uh, they just need to ask their an analyst to make sense of all these infinite integrals and then everything's fine, right? But there, there's now a, a straightforward way in principle how to explain scattering amplitudes and all this to mathematicians. More interesting for us is that we can now study scattering amplitudes through a homotopy algebraic lens with all the benefits. Um, very, very nice and hopefully helpful also to the amplitude community is that, um, I, well, I mean, as an, as an outsider, I always had a little bit this uh, perspective that there seemed to be, uh, seems to be a little bit of the divide between people using amplitude technology and people coming from an action principle. But what L-infinity algebras actually do for you, they put both on equal footing, right? I mean, remember that the action is given by an L-infinity algebra and the amplitudes, at least at tree level, are also given by an L-infinity algebra, namely by minimal model of this L-infinity algebra, and both are quasi-isomorphic equivalent, right? I mean, this framework really puts action and amplitudes um, on equal footing. Structure of amplitudes should be reflected in homotopy algebraic structures or refinements of the L-infinity algebra that uh, describes our um, field theory. Yes, and um, after concluding this, let me switch now to color kinematics duality and the double copy, probably the most important uh, application of homotopy algebra, certainly for this workshop here. Um, okay, so Leron has already given a nice introduction to color kinematics duality, so I don't have to say too much. Let me just highlight um, the most important points. So we have a field theory that has a symmetry Lie algebra G, that's a general starting point. And we say that this theory is CK dual. If it's tree level amplitudes can be parameterized by cubic Feynman diagrams, in a particular way, namely in such a way that the kinematical numerators that you obtain in these Feynman diagrams have the same algebraic properties as the G or color factors, right? I mean, this is what we mean by color kinematics duality, right? I mean, this is tree level color kinematics duality comments about loop level at the very end. Then. This has been proved for Young Mills theory, as you all know, and uh, there's also the so called double copy, which is a lot of um, kind of the key motivation for studying CK duality, certainly. Um, if you have a CK dual field theory and you have the amplitudes in CK dual form, you can replace the color factors with a second copy of the kinematical numerators, and then you obtain the double copy of the original field theory, right? And again, uh, it's known that in Young-Mills theory, you get something that is semi-classically equivalent to n equals zero supergravity, semi-classically equivalent, meaning that they share the same tree level scattering amplitudes, right? But more details you saw already in Leron's and certainly also in Johannes talk. Um, Okay, so let's now analyze this a little bit further and see what this means from a homotopy algebraic perspective. Yeah, because um, after all, abstract nonsense clarifies also everything. It orders everything, but here I think it also clarifies quite a few things. Right, so, so this is our definition of CK duality uh, with the important points highlighted, cubic Feynman diagrams, kinematical numerators, right, that reflect the algebraic pr properties. The homotopy algebraic perspective, um, well, first of all, cubic Feynman diagrams, as I said a few times before, that amounts to strictifying your L-infinity algebra, right? Instead of having an L-infinity algebra that has all kinds of higher products uh, as, for example, mu2, mu3, and so on, um, encoding higher and higher interaction terms, we only want cubic interactions. This is guaranteed to exist by abstract nonsense, and this is a particular form of strictification. Then the kinematic numerators versus the color factors that uh, amounts to uh, that, that implies that we split off color to be able to discuss kinematics separately. So here we have our factorization that we saw before in tensor product, right? So the, the strictified Young Mills L infinity algebra is factorized in a differential graded commutative algebra, right? A strict C infinity algebra and a color algebra, right? That's the next ingredient. And uh, now the kinematical factors, and this is new, they map pairs of fields to fields, right? We want to have a kinematical algebra that takes two fields as an input and gives a field as an output. So far in the L-infinity algebra, um, the, the following th thing happens. We have a map of degree zero and it takes two fields, which both have degree one in our L-infinity algebra. Remember L1 is a space of fields takes two elements of degree one and maps it into an element of degree two, which is an anti-field, right? So this 
this kinematical map that we have, the kinematical Lie algebra that we expect the binary bracket there is not part of our L infinity algebra. So there's a new map. It should have degree minus one. It should certainly be related to mu2 because after all it should be the interactions, right? But it's not there yet. So we have to homotopy, homotopy algebraically refine the L infinity algebra. All right, so, so we are on our way towards BV box algebra. So let's give a little bit more motivation of what we actually want. So we want a bracket um, that is related to our bracket mu2 of degree zero that is of degree minus one and this is very reminiscent if you study a little bit the, the algebras that are around uh, in this context of the anti-bracket in BV algebras, right? So, so BV algebra seems to be already something that is good. Then there's a prominence of the D'Alembertian uh, in all the constructors related to CK duality, right? I mean, you always factor out the, the, um, uh, the denominator, which gives you factors of P squared within your cubic diagram. So um, the box should actually feature prominently. And um, then we have a particular structure of our complex. Namely, we have here the fields in degree one, we have the anti-fields in degree two, we have our mu one or differential that maps F into the anti-fields. And um, now what, what, what's quite natural to, to define is actually also uh, yeah, an, an, another operation of degree minus one and H which also squares to zero such that dh plus hd, namely the, the graded commutator of d with h, gives you box, right? So this is a structure that's very familiar if you know um, uh, Hodge decomposition, right? If you know the, the, the adjoint of the exterior derivative, um, gives you precisely such a structure. And this structure is also very, very natural from our perspective, because after all, the fields and the anti-fields are isomorphic vector space, and there's a natural shift isomorphism that takes you from anti-fields to fields if you have a cyclic structure. Um, moreover, such a structure is also found if you look at the open string Dierski Hilbert space. And after all, we would like to look at string theory as an inspiration of how CK duality and the double copy is working. So we have there a very similar structure where the differential corresponds to QBRST, um, the H corresponds to B0, and L0 is identified with a box operator, right? So, so th this structure kind of pops out naturally if you think a little bit about it and uh, read through the literature what's, what's there. So we conclude that we need a BV box algebra and a BV algebra that's slightly refined and contains the Dallin version. So what is that? Um, should say that this has been introduced uh, in slightly less general fashion already in 1997. Um, we have a complex, that's not surprising. So we're always interested in differential graded algebras. In particular, we want a complex graded vector space B together with a differential. Um, and then we want what we call a Hodge triple. So triple DH box such that this relation is satisfied. We have a graded commutative product. This just comes from our strict defined differential graded algebra. It's just the interactions, just the usual interaction that we have. And D should be a derivation with respect to that product. And then we want our second product. And the second product is not the interesting thing because that will encode the kinematical Lie algebra. Right? So we have the second product. It's of degree minus one. And it's completely defined in terms of the structure that we introduced so far. Namely, it's just here we have the usual commutative product, which is given by the interactions, and we have our additional map H, which is given here, right? So the second product is defined in this way, and for consistency, we expect it to satisfy this version of uh, the Poisson relation, essentially, right? So the second product is actually, if you want, mathematicians sometimes call this a Poisson bracket of degree minus one or gas and Harvard bracket, right? And there's additional technical stuff, which we'll I skip over here because it's boring and doesn't uh, contribute much to uh, what's, what's going on. And now we can have an interpretation. So first of all, remember that we took our strictified L infinity algebra and we split off color. That is uh, what we have the C, the differential graded commutative algebra C strict. Um, the theory now is CK dual. If this differential graded commutative algebra can be extended to BV box algebra, right? So, so this structure you have always, you always have a, a differential graded commutative algebra for strict field theory after splitting of color. But if you can extend it to BV box algebra, then by definition, we call this uh, CK dual field theory, right? So, so this is just because this bracket is really the kinematical Lie algebra and all the expected relations are fulfilled. Right, and uh, the subset, namely the, the, the E strict together with the differential and together with the commutative product really form the differential graded commutative algebra C strict in D strict. 
And uh, what is very, very interesting, if you're looking for what how to define abstractly the kinematical Lie algebra, is that the, the elements in B1, so in the graded element 1, in the strictly defined case, together with this bracket, which maps elements in B1, pairs of elements in B1 to an element in B1, is what people would call the kinematical Lie algebra, right? So this is all part of the BB box algebra. The BB box algebra actually clarifies for you what the kinematical Lie algebra for a CK dual field theory is. All right, so the conclusion that we have is a field theory in manifestly CK dual form can be color stripped to a differential graded commutative algebra, which, and this is the condition of being CK dual, can be enhanced to BB box algebra. And examples are by joint scalar field theories that you know, the zeroth copy of Young Mills theory and Chun Simon's theory is also an example of that. You get a very natural BV box algebra. Um, essentially, Chun Simon's theory is incredibly natural because it's just the BV box algebra that arises on the Dram complex of, of your, your space time manifold if you if you add um, uh, the, the, uh, the adjoint of the exterior derivative, right? So, so there's essentially just one structure that's a BV box algebra for Chun Simon's theory. Right, but now let's look at a little bit of a more general CK duality because um, Young Mills theory is certainly not of this form. Young Mills theory is not a strict L infinity algebra. We have seen that there's a new three product and it doesn't fall within this. So, how would you know whether Young Mills theory is actually CK dual or not from a mathematical perspective, right? And how do you use it? Well, for that, we have to um, split off color as we usually do, right? Here we have an L infinity algebra split of color and you get a C infinity algebra left over. And usually what we now would do is we would take the C infinity algebra and strictify, right? We would introduce all the totality bind seal terms and then strictify so that we get a CK dual differential grade commutative algebra and we do our usual test. But we can do the inverse operation. Instead of extending the strictified um, differential grade commutative algebra to a BV box algebra, we forget about strictification work directly with C and demand that C can be extended to BV box infinity algebra, right? So in a sense, you have a commutative diagram of operations, right? I mean, usually we would go from C to C strict and extend it to a strict BV box algebra, BV box algebra. But here we, we save ourselves the, the, the complication of strictification and just say, well, the C infinity algebra can be directly extended to BV box infinity algebra, right? So we have BV box algebra, there's an operator underlying, you can construct a causal dual of that if you want to go through all this um, and you can construct what uh, axiomatically BV box infinity algebra is. And then we can phrase mathematically really what it means for field theory to be CK dual. So field theory with an L infinity algebra that factorize like this into a color Lie algebra and the C infinity algebra is CK dual exactly if this C infinity algebra extends to BV box infinity algebra, right? And I should say, um, Leron already gave credit to Michael Reiterer um, uh, that the crucial insight that these are the right algebras is actually due to him. And um, yeah, I mean, so, so, so our work is just refining and, and uh, concretifying what, what, what he already outlined in a very specific case for Young Mills theory at three level. Okay, but this is still not the most general setting, I would say, for where one should consider CK duality, uh, for the simple reason that uh, not all theories have a color factor, right? So in a most general framework in which we can discuss the syngamies that um, Leron talked about, we would also like to see n equals zero supergravity as a CK dual field theory, because we can split it off into two factors and we can combine it with a color factor to recover Young Mills theory in a single mean, right? So how do we see that n equals zero supergravity has a particular special form? Well, for this, you really have to work a little bit harder. So we can regard a color algebra also as a BV box algebra trivially, and then we can define a generalized tensor product between BV box algebras, BV box infinity algebras, which is actually inspired by um, string theory consideration. And then CK duality in this most general framework actually amounts to factorization of the L infinity algebra of our field theory, not in color times C infinity, but into a special tensor product of BV box infinity algebra, right? This is the most general framework I think that, that one can um, use for CK duality. Okay, yeah, I'm short on time. Let me quickly summarize the advantages. Well, first of all, we have a clean mathematical definition of what CK duality is, at least at tree level. And we have a clean definition of what the kinematical algebra is. And uh, computing this BV box infinity extension is actually not too hard. So there's an algorithm how to construct them. Once you have the BV box infinity algebra, as uh, Leron already pointed out, 
you have very clear interpretation of the steps rendering an action manifestly CK dual. So you know what blowing up vertices is any strictly CKation. You know what the tautology bind sale terms are, namely their particular products. You know what the CK duality relations are, namely particular homotopy relations that appear in your BV box infinity algebra, right? All of this is now getting directly homotopy algebraic interpretation. And uh, you can see if, if that, that has some advantages. We claim, at least in our current draft of the paper, that we have some evidence for computational advantages. But um, yeah, we'll have to see if this pans out. Uh, we should also say that this, of course, involves the whole BD complex. So our notion of CK duality is uh, a notion at the level of the BD action. It incorporates ghosts, anti-fields, and we get fully manifestly CK dual Feynman rules ultimately. There's an explicit link to string field theory, which is always good if you believe that string theory is underlying everything. And we have a slightly more general notion of CK duality and the double copy, right? So there are quite a few advantages that you get just working uh, from the perspective of homotopy algebras. Our main motivation, though, is a clean mathematical definition of what it is. All right, so um, I can say a few words about the double copies. So um, we have inspiration from string theory, namely how you compute the closed Hilbert space from two from the tensor product of two copies of the open uh, string Hilbert space. Essentially, um, if you just take the tensor product, you double the domain, which is well known and link, links to, to the area known as double field theory. Uh, in double field theory, you then have to restrict, you impose a section condition, you can do that, and then you impose some further constraint level matching and so on, as familiar from the textbooks. Um, and then you can mimic the same construction actually for BB box algebras. And then you take, uh, you have a generalized tensor product of two box infinity algebras, which gives you an L infinity algebra with all the constraints that you want uh, implemented. So the double copy from this perspective is nothing but a generalized tensor product between two BB box infinity algebras. Okay, so um, last slide before I conclude, um, comments on the loop level. So what about the loop level? All of this, all of what I talked about certainly valid at the tree level, um, but our constructions are based on the strictification procedure, right? Whenever I said, okay, we have strictified field theories, we have blown up all the vertices, uh, we use strictification. If we say we can, do the inverse operation of saying instead of comparing a strictified theory to BV box algebra, we compare the original theory to BV box infinity algebra, then we also invoked strictification. So, what is strictification physically? Well, it's semi classical equivalence, which means equivalent tree level and S matrix. But um, the strictified actions, the, the L infinity algebras that are related by strictifications, actually related physically by field redefinitions. So you, you rotate your field content. You can also integrate in and out fields. That's also permitted in the strictification, right? So, so it's really semi-classical equivalence. But if you perform field redefinitions and you have a path integral measure around in your discussion because you do uh, quantum computations, then of course you get Jacobians. And some of these Jacobians are harmless because they just essentially amount to one in dimensional regularization. So you can, can drop them. But um, from our computation, we see that some of them are not so harmless. So these, these harmless field redefinitions are not sufficient for our purpose. At least there's no reason for us to believe that they are sufficient. And therefore, we get additional counter terms from the Jacobians and unitarity is broken. And the question is now, and this is a big question, essentially, is this a problem for our intents and purposes? So, I mean, uh, most of the amplitudes community is, all, uh, of course, very, very keen to work with unitarity methods and uh, the proofs of the double copy are based on unitarity. All this is not directly relevant for our, uh, for, in our construction. We don't encounter many problems that amplitudes people face by working with unitarity methods. However, the question is whether the statements that we can extract by working semi-classically uh, and with the counter terms are good for what you want to use the double copy for, right? So um, what we have is we don't, we certainly know that the counter terms exist, that's not a problem. And they're reasonably well under control. So we think that we can identify them well in explicit computation. Also, we are, are closer perhaps to string theory origin of CK duality because these structures that we presented in particular the BB box algebra structures are there in string theory? And now the question is, which of the properties would you rather preserve? Do you want the BV box algebra to be preserved when you go from string theory to field theory? Or would you like unitarity to be preserved, right? And what is ultimately the thing that shows you 
um, which is suitable for uh, what you want the double copy to use for, for example, in particular, studying the ultraviolet behavior of supergravity, right? I mean, this is ultimately the question whether you like the extension to loop level or not. Everything else is actually working. We have this algorithm that uh, Leron presented, that's all fine. And then you can also use this homotopy algebraic perspective that we have to um, remove the qualifier that we work at loop level and really work. Uh, that we work at tree level and really work at loop level, right? But it depends what you want to do with these things. Also. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Christian. We are out of time. Sorry, yeah. we are really out of time. Okay, right, right. 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 Sorry, uh, yeah, my, my, my clock seems to be a little bit slow, but yeah. Okay, summary is essentially that we used this homotopy algebra and that we had a lot of insight into the structure of amplitudes and CK duality amounts to BB box algebra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Questions? I don't see questions from the audience, so maybe uh, let's go with the next